This laptop is not kind of nobody. Its predecessor is the well-known Toshiba laptop. In 2018, Sharp bought Toshiba's PC business, and renamed it. Just kidding. Dynabook has nothing to do with Ultraman Dyna. It's a wholly owned subsidiary of Sharp established in August 2020. From Toshiba to Sharp, Dynabook inherits the 30 years experience of Toshiba. With the factories and technicians from Toshiba and Sharp supply chain, various types of laptops are provided. This is the flagship of Dynabook in 2021, Portage X30WJ. It's a two-in-one laptop, weighing less than one kilogram, with magnesium alloy case. It's designed on Intel Evo platform and tested against 10 military-grade requirements. Harman and Kardon speakers is configured. The whole design is rare. So how does it perform? Let's take a look. This Dynabook has an i7-1165G7 chip with four cores and eight threads, a dual-channel 16GB and 4266MHz RAM, a 1TB Samsung PM981 SSD with PCLE 3.0 x 4, a 13.3-inch 1080p convertible IPS touchscreen with matte glass. The reference price of 512GB SSD version on Jingdong is about $2,100, a high price. As an Ultrabook above $1,500, its design is worth talking about. My first impression is ultralight. The official weight is 989 grams. After real measurement, the height is 17.2 to 17.5 millimeters, and the weight is 935 grams. It's hard to believe that it has a 53WH battery, weighing close to four cell phones. The portability and the battery are ideal for business people, but the texture is mediocre. To strike a balance between weight and strength, Dynabook uses a high-strength aeronautical material, magnolium. Due to the material, the case looks like plastic, but it's still metal for it feels cold in winter. Also, with magnolium and dark green finish, fingerprints are obvious. Now let's open it. It supports 360-degree flip. The hinge is stable. After fold, the hinge reserves some room for airflow on the bottom. It ensures airflow both in laptop mode and tablet mode. This kind of design is rare in convertible laptops. Another unique design is the camera. It has one regular camera on top and another one above the keyboard. It's a dual camera laptop. The keyboard camera is not intended for shooting your chin but for tablet mode. I think the photo is a bit better than most laptops. The location is not really reasonable. If you erect and raise the screen, your hands will easily block the camera. If the next gen continues this design, I think it's better to place it elsewhere. And there is another problem about the camera. The small indicator beside indicates the working camera, but it can't switch automatically. Sometimes we may forget to switch it, and it'll shoot my double chin at the next video conference. It's too embarrassing. It needs to be improved. Now let's talk about keyboard. It's okay when you're typing. And key travel is long. But the press feels a bit soft. But the function key combinations are relatively complete. Like, Fn plus F11 activates numeric keypad. Fn plus F10 activates arrow keys. It doesn't have standard large arrow keys and numeric keypad, but you can reach them in that way. It's an elaborate design. Next comes IO2 Thunderbolt 4 an HDMI plus an audio jack on the left, a USB-A and micro SD card reader on the right. Considering the thickness, I think its external scalability is up to par. Let's get into tests. The screen panel is manufactured by Sharp. It's a matte screen with full glass cover. Combination of matte and all glass touch is rare in laptops. The matte screen prevents glare and presents smoother sliding than glossy screen. The color volume and coverage are nearly 100% sRGB. Delta E averages 1.24 with max 2.26. Max brightness is 420 nits with DC dimming. But the response time is ordinary, with 32.6 milliseconds for black to white and 56.5 milliseconds for gray to gray. Smearing is obvious when moving windows. Generally, it's an average display. Popular new features, like high resolution, high refresh rate, are all excluded. They need a better screen. Thanks to the color gamut, accuracy, 360-degree flip, touchscreen and anti-glare matte glass, it's enough for daily use.
After screen is performance. For i7-1165 G7, in Cinebench R20 loop test, the score is stable, basically fluctuating around 1800 scores. The power is also very stable, except it reached 45 watts at the first time, it boosted to 35 watts for a short time and fell back to 21 watts. Corresponding frequency is about 2.9 GHz. For iGPU, 96 EU Iris Z graphics up to 1300 MHz. Time Spy got 1568, FSE, 2389, and Superposition, 1013. The overall score is about 14% higher than i51135G7 with 4266 MHz. Given an Ultrabook with iGPU, we didn't test standalones but a few online games. Dota 2 at ultra settings barely ran at 49.4 FPS. Apex only averaged 43 and went below 25 in intense fighting. The experience was bad. Now it's content creation. Without DGPU, it's unsuitable for heavy tasks, such as PRNA. It got 589 for PS. It's basically enough for simple editing. In general, its performance is conservative, the same as most ultralight laptops. There is no DGPU in pursuit of size and weight. The power setting is also low. It's enough for light tasks. But if you need games or creation work, gaming or all-around laptops are better. It's not difficult to disassemble it. Remove all screws to uncover the bottom case. A 53WH battery takes up much space whose lifespan is 11 hours and 21 minutes in PC Mark 10. The soldered LPDDR4X4266 MHz RAM is at the back of the motherboard. The tested machine carries a 1TB SSD of Samsung PM981A and PCIe 3.0x4. Sequential read, write is about 3000. Write decreases to 1500 when beyond buffer memory. Storage is 512G for market and speed and SLC cache is lower. The Wi-Fi card is an Intel AX201 supporting Wi-Fi 6. Finally, thermal test. The thermal module consists of dual heat pipes and dual small fans. Let's see actual cooling performance in stress test. For an Ultrabook without DGPU, we carried stress CPU under low load. With 25 degrees around. After 30 minutes stress, the CPU ran at 21 watts. Reads fluctuated between 66 and 82, similar for clock speed, ranging from 3.1 to 4.1 GHz. In stress FPU, CPU ran at 21 watts with no change. Temperatures fluctuated between 67 and 80 degrees and clock speed between 2.3 and 3.2 GHz. Now let's look at exterior temperature. The highest 37.3 degrees appeared at key 4, but the whole board is cool with most parts below 34 degrees. 30.5 degrees for central back. Max 44 degrees for exhaust vent. Its noise level under full load was 45.8 decibels a normal level. In my view, its cooling is regular. As a small ultrabook, Performance doesn't come first. It's enough for most light tasks because of regular power and noise level and low temperatures. But I found something strange about the temperature when charging. From 0 to 50%, the left side of keyboard peaked at 43.1 degrees. The bottom case peaked higher at 47.4 degrees. Remove the plate, it's found that heating is mainly from PMIC at 87 degrees. The temperature in quick charge is higher than in stress tests, affecting user experience. After the review, I'll list three pros and cons for your reference as usual. Pros. Firstly, ultralight, less than one kilogram with laptop only. Usually, convertible laptops are slightly heavier than traditional ones. Very few weigh below one kilogram. But this ultralight one weighs only 935 grams, which is very portable. Secondly, the core and exterior temperatures are low under full load. The keyboard is only at max 37 degrees in stress test with most parts less than 33 degrees. It's cool even under heavy load. Thirdly, more ports than laptops of the same kind. For this kind of Ultrabook, every OEM wants as few as possible ports. All USB-C's design is popular, but this one has more ports with a USB-A, an HDMI and a 3.5mm audio jack. Docking station is unnecessary for daily use. After pros, now cons. Firstly, quite expensive. With average specs, the price is about $2,100 which exceeds most budgets. Personally, if Dynabook does want higher popularity, the price should be lower. Secondly, it's hot on the left in quick charge when it reached 43 degrees. And the back is higher. For those users who often plug in and out, even for those charging it on beds and sofas, 
the heat affects user experience. Thirdly, the case texture is poor. When we reviewed Ultrabooks above $1,500, we usually describe them as fantastic. But this one feels like plastic because of the material. There is no sense of superiority. After the review, X30WJ still impressed me. It is ultralight. Honestly, it's the lightest two-in-one convertible laptop I've ever reviewed. Also, it is delicately designed. For example, the camera above the keyboard, and the hinge guaranteeing airflow. In my view, the designer made efforts for it. Considering the position of the product, it's more suitable for office workers who need high portability or deep-pocketed students with low demand for games. In addition, it's Evo certified. Its performance, response speed and transfer speed are all certificated. It's also tested against 10 military-grade requirements. It adapts to extreme temperature and humidity changes, drop vibration, hit, high altitudes and dust. So it can handle whatever life throws your way. Unfortunately, it is expensive. It has no advantage in terms of exterior and material. As the brand is still not well-known, few high-end consumers will choose it. Dynabook needs budget laptops with characteristics to open up the market. We do like to review this kind of expensive and showy luxurious laptops. But I also hope they can stand in consumers' shoes and launch more good budget laptops. Okay, that's all for this video. If you enjoy this video, please hit like and subscribe. If you want to talk with me every day, you can follow us on WeChat official account. This laptop may be worth it or not, but all we want is to share information and provide guidance. This is Biba Review Studio. I'm Jawan. I'll see you next time.